Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar series on quantum uh, computing applications in the financial sector, which is co-organized by uh, the Rethink Labs at the Keen Institute at UNC Chapel Hill and uh, the IBM Q Hub uh, at NC State University. Um, I'm your host. My name is Eric Geisels. I'm a professor of finance at uh, Keen and uh, Flagler Business School and a Professor of Economics at the uh, Department of Economics uh, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. This is year two of uh, what was last year a very exciting uh, webinar series, um, and we are of, of a great off on to a great start uh, in uh, in the second year with uh, uh, our, our first speaker, Stephen Herbert. Um, uh, he is um, a uh, affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge uh, Department of Computer Science and Technology. Uh, he's also a senior research scientist at Cambridge Quantum Computing and a by fellow at the Churchill College uh, in the C Cambridge, UK. Uh, I particularly like actually the um, uh, sort of the motto of uh, 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 Cambridge uh, uh, quantum computing. It says, think like nature, compute like nature. I, I really like that. Uh, that's sort of a, a very good way of characterizing. Um, uh, Stephen's talk is going to be, uh, uh, the title is Quantum uh, Monte Carlo Integration, the Full Advantage and Minimal Circuit uh, Depth, which is a very timely paper with some really, really, really cool in new insights uh, on a very important topic of uh, amplitude estimation. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please feel free to write your questions in the chat during the talk. Uh, I would like to keep all the questions uh, to be answered at the end of Stephen's talk, un un unless there is a very small technical clarification question or something like that. But other than that, I prefer not to interrupt the speaker and we can have our conversation afterwards. So Stephen, it's all yours. Uh, thanks and welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Thanks for the kind introduction. I would just uh, share my screen now and go to uh, full screen. Uh, so hopefully that's uh, visible. Uh, sorry, let me just bring. Uh, that's not. Yet it's visible. not quite full screen yet. Okay, let's just, yeah, and, and we also lo lost uh, your uh, slides. Yeah, let's just. Uh, okay, so let's now go. Okay, is that uh, big enough for everybody? Yeah, that yeah that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so yeah, thanks very much for the, the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually recently become the head of quantum algorithms at uh, Cambridge Quantum. Um, and so yeah, as, uh, as Eric said, quantum Monte Carlo integration, the full advantage and minimal circuit depth. Uh, this is a paper I put out, um, yeah, uh, three or four months ago now, and it's, it's garnered a lot of interest, which is very uh, welcome. And I'm very pleased to have the chance to speak again uh, about this today. I aim to speak for about 45 minutes. The uh, Monte Carlo integration part will take about 20, 25 minutes. And then I want to speak a little bit about a couple more um, contributions I've made uh, since, which are related. I, I don't have time to go really deep into those, but, um, you know, happy to have questions, happy to give you at least a flavour of, of the other things I've been thinking about uh, to, to really think about uh, making quantum end-to-end -end quantum solutions, which will actually give uh, an advantage rather than having some sort of gaps, some uh, results in principle, but then some gaps which are uh, work to do. Um, so yeah, just to start with, I, I start with a, a slide on Monte Carlo integration. I, I imagine this is kind of telling you something most of you already know, but there's no harm in going over it uh, just for the sake of um, making sure uh, that I'm using uh, notation, et cetera, that's familiar to everybody. So what, what we're saying really is we've got some integral, uh, some expectation, uh, and we can't explicitly compute this integral. So what we're going to do is we're just going to sample, if we can, from the distribution, and we're going to average, and uh, that's Monte Carlo integration. And 
the more samples we take, the better our estimate. Um, and uh, just uh, just to be clear, as soon as we do this on a quantum, uh, sorry, on a computer, digital computer, whether it's classical or quantum, we're not actually sampling from uh, from P of X. We're sampling from some discretized version of P of X, and that's kind of all taken care of under the hood, basically in computation, whether it's classical or whether it's quantum. Um, and the final thing to point out is, uh, in general, this is often uh, more interesting if we're applying a function to our samples. So we're not computing the expectation of the of the, the random variables, variables themselves, but we're first applying a function and then computing the expectation. Um, and I'll come on to, in particular, why that's interesting for us when we talk about quantum Monte Carlo integration. Uh, but the first, the first thing I want to start with uh, after that is the results. Uh, get straight to it and, and give you a, a sort of flavour of what's to come. So, the place to start on this slide is MSE, mean squared error. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, just read this symbol as proportional to, so just a constant out the front. Um, so classically, we, you know, Q is the number of samples we we need to draw. So uh, classically, we take uh, sort of proportional to q to the minus one samples to get uh, to converge to some specified mean squared error. Uh, and what we really want is the exponent here to be as large a negative number as possible. That means we're converging as quickly as possible, which is the name of the game uh, with these kind of uh, algorithms. So this is where if we now look at second row, uh, still looking at this column, we see we've got q to the minus two. This is the kind of famed quadratic advantage in quantum computing, which basically means if we take about time t to converge to our required accuracy on a classical computer, we'll only take about time uh, square root of t uh, on a quantum computer. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that time could be spread over parallel cores in both cases potentially, but, but there's a headline kind of time complexity, that's the quadratic advantage. However, if we now shift our attention to the final column, we see this quantum and classical arithmetic. So what we mean here is we have to do things like square root, inverse sign, potentially more sophisticated functions on the quantum computer. So we have to build uh, little sub-circuits, uh, well, not so little sub-circuits, uh, to actually uh, do these, these operations which compute these kind of arithmetic um, properties and arithmetic functions of our samples. And these are exactly the sort of things that we really can't afford to do if we're talking about near-term quantum advantage. Um, so there was a proposal to work around this, and I, I think this is a really nice idea um, to do with rescaling the support of the, uh, the probability distribution. However, you, you did bypass the quantum arithmetic, but you lost some of your quantum advantage. You now have only got Q to the minus four over three. And so this is where the kind of the, the best of all worlds claims I put out in the paper comes in, uh, because with Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration, my algorithm, uh, we still get the, the full quadratic advantage in the convergence, and we only need classical arithmetic. And in fact, uh, we can compute any integral, whereas the rescaled method, at least as it was presented in the paper, uh, would only compute the expectation. It wouldn't compute the, uh, the expectation of a function. Um, and the final thing which, which has become apparent to me is quite interesting is when we talk about this in terms of finance uh, in particular, it's quite relevant that a lot of work in finance is to do with a variance reduction because this isn't really a, this is a constant for our purposes but it is something which depends on the variance and uh, in fact that is the variance when the uh you know when we talk about the distribution the, you know the implicitly invoked distribution when we apply the function which when we're talking about uh, some financial uh, functions that could in fact be very high variance and so we actually converge very slowly, even though it's a constant factor, that's quite a, a costly constant factor. And something to point out is the quantum algorithm is fundamentally different in this way. The constant is, is a genuine constant. It basically, it will vary only a, a very small amount and it's easy to show uh, there's kind of a hard upper bound, which is, is not particularly costly um, because it's a different way of computing uh, the, the expectation. And so you kind of get this additional non, not asymptotic, but potentially very valuable uh, additional saving by doing this on a quantum computer. So Monte Carlo integration, quantum Monte Carlo integration. So our starting point is we have, a, we're given some circuit P that prepares a quantum state kept P, 
which encodes a probability distribution of interest. And what we mean by this, if you're familiar with kind of um, quantum computing notation and the Born rule is when we measure in the computational basis state, we sample from P of X. Uh, the, the quantum computing notation is actually fairly light in this talk. So if you're not familiar with this, don't worry too much. It's not gonna be kind of, that's it. You won't follow the rest of the talk. I hope it will still be accessible because uh, we'll be sticking to kind of statistical and financial um, notation mainly. Uh, but it is important to point out that we also have a second circuit R that operates on P and an extra qubit zero, such that we basically put on the value of interest, uh, the quantity of interest onto the amplitude of this extra qubit. And so if we skip over this line, really, the most important thing to look at here is that the probability of measuring one on the final qubit is sum of P of X, F of X, which is exactly, if we kind of go back to uh, the first slide here, this is exactly what we're trying to uh, compute. Um, and once we've got this, then we can get the quadratic advantage using quantum amplitude estimation. That's where the quadratic advantage lies. However, uh, the, the key question really, the thing I've kind of hidden away is uh, the circuit R, because in fact, in general, R is, is where this kind of hidden complexity, these um, arithmetic sub-circuits lie. And that's what's really costly and what we want to avoid. And in fact, R will occasionally uh, be a very simple circuit. And one occasion is if F is a trigonometric function. So if F is either cause of, uh, don't worry about N and omega too much, if it's just cause of some, some um, constant times X or sine of some constant times X, what we can do is uh, we can compute, we can um, prepare the, uh, the final qubit uh, such that it encodes the amplitude using just a single bank of rotation, uh, RY rotation gates. And that's uh, where my claim of minimal complexity comes from, because what we've got here is you've got a kind of a register of NI wires or NI bits or qubits. And in order to get some quantity pertaining to this register onto a qubit, we're really gonna need uh, at least NI two qubit gates. <clears throat> that's gonna be a minimum. Don't worry too much about the single qubit gate. Uh, that's actually something we can kind of neglect in terms of near-term uh, hardware, except they're, they're basically very quick and don't really add any um, loss of coherence. So this really is the best we can do. Um, and something else I just want to pause on here is uh, this, the marginalization happens uh, implicitly with the quantum computing uh, when we do quantum amplitude estimation. Um, so in general, we won't actually use Monte Carlo, we won't necessarily use Monte Carlo integration classically uh, if we've only got a univariate distribution, there are other methods which may converge faster. Um, really, Monte Carlo integration is valuable for the multivariate case. And actually, I've shown here, if we've kind of got, uh, in this case, ND registers of, so ND dimensions of a multivariate distribution, then we, you know, the, we implicitly marginalize over all but the, the dimension of interest by doing this. Um, and that's something I'm now going to drop and, and assume it's a univariate case again, but I just wanted to highlight that. Um, but really the pressing question is now, how can we use the fact that we can only do uh, Monte Carlo integrals of this form without incurring this kind of um, infeasible complexity in these uh, arithmetic subcircuits? Well, that's in fact my main result is that we can. And so this, this um, theorem basically says <clears throat> if we want to compute this Monte Carlo um, integral mu uh, and we've got uh, we've got some mean squared error q to the minus lambda so q is still uh, the number of samples the number of, of uses of a circuit preparing a quantum state and lambda is the convergence rate of some QAE subroutine I'll just say uh, a word more on that in a second and um, then we can just using circuits of this form uh, and the reason I've said lambda here, quantumly, we'd normally think of lambda as equal to two. That's the quadratic advantage. But there have been a number of very interesting proposals for um, near-term quantum amplitude estimation where lambda is, is a constant between one and two. So not the full quadratic advantage, something which is still better than classical, but um, we save circuit depth. And this would be uh, a, a complementary gain to what I'm going to show you today. Uh, because we do call quantum amplitude estimation as a subroutine. So you can basically plug any 
amplitude estimation in, including one which has this kind of trade-off where we, we have shallower circuits, but with a slightly, uh, slightly slower convergence. Um, then I just want to show that that is possible. But for the purpose of this talk, you can just think of lambda as equal to two uh, if you want to, that is, uh, that's also fine. So um, how does this work? Well, first of all, we're gonna notice that we're doing this on a quantum computer, a, a digital computer, sorry. Uh, and as I mentioned at the start, the reason I mentioned that is when we're talking about sampling for probability distribution on a digital computer, be it a quantum computer or a classical computer, we've already considered that to be uh, finitely supported. Um, and so what that means is it doesn't really matter what f of x is, what the function applied to the samples is, um, apart from where x, p of x is non-zero. And I should say that, you know, one thing to point out actually on here is, uh, even if f of x, the function applied to the samples is just f of x equals x, so we're just computing the expectation, um, then we still, actually can't do that within a reasonable uh, quantum circuit depth. We, we really can only do these kind of functions. Um, so even if f of x is equal to x, then we only care about that between a certain uh, bounded region of, uh, of x. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of chop up um, f of x at, at the support of p of x. And then we're going to just kind of substitute in another function, which I call f tilde of x, such that this Roman f of x is now periodic, uh, piecewise periodic. And moreover, we're gonna make sure these two join together uh, in a sufficiently smooth way uh, that the Fourier series co coefficients decay as one over n cubed. And in the paper, this is quite fiddly and a bit technical, but you can always make sure that that happens. Um, and therefore, because we've got a, uh, a periodic function, it has a Fourier series, and because we've, we've guaranteed uh, by construction that has this convergence, uh, we will see how that allows us to get the full quantum advantage. Um, so yeah, I think probably it, it's almost clear what, what's coming now, but this is the quantity we're trying to estimate. We can just swap in uh, Roman f of x because whenever p of x is non-zero, these two are the same. Uh, we can swap in f of x, it's Fourier series decomposition. Uh, and then if we do a little bit of change of the order for the summation, we can see what we need to do is to estimate um, functions of this form. And this, you know, for those of you who are eagle-eyed, you'll see this is where the n and omega, this is the significance of the n and the omega uh, a couple of slides back. And so these are, these are what we can estimate on the quantum computer uh, with these minimally deep circuits. And so really the rest of the proof is, well, we've got these infinite sums and obviously not gonna get any sort of advantage if we require an infinite sum. And so the one over n cubed is, is uh, critical basically to make sure that we can uh, truncate uh, this sum early enough such that we still get the desired accuracy, but we have uh, an overall acceptable amount of computations so an acceptable number of sums that we need to uh, estimate for. And in fact, we actually, uh, you know, the proof actually goes into the fact that for the higher harmonics where this contributes a, an increasingly small amount to the overall uh, the overall quantity trying to be estimated, you actually basically do uh, spend uh, less effort trying to estimate those anyway. And that's all taken care of. And actually that's quite technical. I, I really don't think it adds much uh, to, uh, to go through it in this presentation. So I'm gonna now move on to some results. So this was tested on a quantum computer simulator. So this is a distribution just made up something uh, which could be encoded with a nice and shallow quantum circuit, not completely trivial in the sense that it's got an entangling gate and it's uh, not something like a uniform distribution where some methods can behave artificially well. But also I don't want something so complicated because in truth, it doesn't really tell me much. You know, I ran this on a simulator on my laptop, so I didn't want it to, uh, to overheat my laptop and take too long. Uh, to run and this this was enough for the proof of principle I was trying to get. So if we now shift our attention to this plot, this is root mean squared error, this is use of p or, or number of samples. And so what we want is, is to, to kind of uh, slope down as steeply as possible. Um, and as soon as we are, if we look at this thick blue line, this is classical Monte Carlo integration. And as soon as we're below this, then we're getting the quantum advantage, we're converging to an accuracy more quickly than what we could do classically. 
And so the, the circle, uh, the dashed line with cir circular uh, markings, this is Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration. This is my algorithm. And actually we're getting the quantum advantage here, which is 10 to three use of P. But for those of you who are familiar with how amplitude estimation works, this crossing over point actually, this is total use of P, but any actual circuit only required eight sequential uses of the operator Q, the, the Grove iterate. So I think that's quite encouraging when we talk about near term is you are getting a relatively early quantum advantage and certainly relative to this rescaling method, which I mentioned briefly at the start, which, which sort of is mathematically nice, but does come at the cost of a, a slower convergence as we can also see here. So applications, well, we are uh, very, uh, I think, uh, welcoming of the fact that finance has been a, a very early enthusiast for quantum computing. And um, certainly with uh, Monte Carlo integration, amplitude estimation, uh, much of the, the early enthusiasm has come from finance. And um, broadly speaking, we think about Monte Carlo integration um, as doing one of two things, either Monte Carlo estimation, so directly uh, estimating some statistical quantity of interest or simulation-based optimization. So here, basically what we're saying is we've got some kind of optimization where the bottleneck is every single cost function evaluation requires averaging or marginalizing over kind of a, a large number of uncertain factors. And if you think about what's going on under the hood, that's just a Monte Carlo uh, or likely to be a Monte Carlo integration at each cost function evaluation. So you can kind of have uh, this idea of quantum enhanced optimization. Um, and derivative pricing has become very much kind of a canonical example of Monte Carlo estimation and uh, portfolio optimization is uh, potentially uh, an example of the latter. Um, so to recap, Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration is um, where we basically uh, do this kind of function applied stage. Uh, so applying functions to samples very efficiently, we, we basically get it for free, by which I mean, regardless of the function you want to apply to your, your samples, you can do it with these minimally deep circuits and then construct the function uh, from kind of uh, a Fourier series and construct the, the result you want in classical post-processing. And that's what I mean by free is no additional quantum operations and an acceptable uh, increase in classical operations. So, uh, derivative pricing, I'll just skip over this, but just, you know, just because it is, it is very much the canon, canonical example we work towards. Uh, you draw a sample, you, you know, if we're talking about European options, this also applies to more sophisticated options, but just to keep things simple, you, um, you're going to, yeah, you, you're going to buy the option of it. If it's a call option, you're going to buy it if, if you're going to make profit. So you've got the max function, and then we're just going to average, this is going to give us our payoff, we're going to average to get the expected payoff. Um, and so we have actually looked into um, comparing uh, Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration uh, for more sophisticated uh, path dependent derivatives um, based on the, the threshold for uh, advantage in derivative pricing paper put out by uh, Goldman and IBM. And uh, I should say that they had a slightly different emphasis. They were more looking at kind of wall clock time, whereas I was looking at reduction of a particular circuit. Um, but my, my kind of quantification of what Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration would do uh, suggests that we get a, a, a reduction in circuit depth of between 30 and, and nine, you know, in some cases more than 90%. Uh, and when we're talking, you know, to be clear, when we're talking about the first quantum advantage, when we're talking about that kind of race to some useful quantum advantage, some uh, convergence on some problem of interest, um, faster or at all that we couldn't do classically, these kind of savings are really valuable because that, that's a resource uh, requirement less and the quantum hardware is scaling up at the moment. So we're going to get that sooner uh, using very quantum Monte Carlo integration. We can say that for sure that we're definitely going to get there sooner using this. I think I've probably already um, mentioned uh, pretty much what's going on with uh, sim quantum enhanced um, optimization. So basically, if you've got a portfolio, um, your you know your cost function may look a bit like um, I, uh, the payoff of uh, some portfolio of correlated assets, and that's uh, you know similar to doing well. It's exactly doing a quantum Monte Carlo uh, estimation at each cost function evaluation. So even though 
people talk about uh, potentially things like um, annealing and things like that for portfolio optimization. I think there's potential application of um, uh, uh, Monte Carlo estimation towards portfolio optimization as well. And I should say uh, the other one as well as derivative pricing, uh, various quantities pertaining to financial risk uh, are also kind of often cited as potential applications of quantum computing in finance. So uh, that's the whistle stop tour through uh, Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration. But now just to spend the, the last sort of um, 15 to 20 minutes on some other results. And I've potentially got a few more slides than we need. We'll see how we go uh, on this. But really, uh, the reason I want to say about this is as happy as I am with this result, Monte Carlo integration uh, is a three-step process. We prepare some samples, we apply a function and we average, and quantum Monte Carlo integration exactly the same. We prepare a state, uh, we apply a circuit encoding the function, and we do quantum amplitude estimation. And uh, as I say, as happy as I am with very quantum Monte Carlo integration, it does only apply uh, to this middle step. It, it's, uh, I believe, um, well, I more than believe, I have a great conviction in my belief that that's uh, the best you can do as applying this, this uh, middle step. And that's why at Cambridge Quantum, we, we're kind of putting a lot of um, uh, faith in this. And we, we go through the process of, process of patenting uh, the core idea as well. Uh, but nevertheless, in terms of actually building a useful product, I do need to address the other two as well. And so over the summer, I released a couple more papers, the first a uh, little more than a note, but the second quite a chunky contribution in its own right, addressing each of these. And I'd just like to spend a little bit of time uh, just giving a fairly high level uh, introduction to these two as well, because I think they'll certainly be relevant and interesting to this audience. So uh, the first one, every classical sampling circuit is a quantum sampling circuit. And the second one, noise aware quantum amplitude estimation. So the, the reason that uh, if, you know, this first step of preparing state is quite close to my heart is because as somebody who's kind of trained in uh, kind of, I've got fairly conventional uh, education in quantum computing and something like taking a circuit P as an input is something which immediately sets off alarm bells for me because that sounds like a kind of a, a, um, an advantage in query complexity where we've kind of got this step which we're taking as one operation but we don't really know what the complexity is and in particular I was really worried when I just saw a lot of statements about using the Grover Rudolph method uh, to prepare these states because when you actually read out what's going on in Grover Rudolph for most um, actually, for most interesting distributions, uh, there's actually uh, classical Monte Carlo going on under the hood. And if you do a proper audit of the kind of the total complexity, then you actually find there's no quantum advantage and actually published on that earlier this year and proved that there's no quantum advantage. Um, so I was working on this kind of very, you know, what I consider to be quite an elegant idea for Monte Carlo integration, but it was always kind of a worry about this circuit P. And so I, I realized that uh, actually the kind of the, the, um, the solution is really hiding in plain sight, which is when we talk about classical, uh, classical sampling, a classical sample is itself not a single, uh, a single thing which kind of magically appears. Uh, in general, we have to think of a classical sample as a deterministic map from a uniformly random bit string to a sample from the distribution of interest. And basically we can use that property to actually construct um, uh, the quantum state ket p or the quantum circuit p um, and basically what we do is because it's a deterministic map we can always compile that down to a logical circuit and therefore we can always uh, compile the reversible form of that circuit as standard results in quantum computing and so if we just use a bank of Hadamard gates to prepare the uniform distribution and plug that in to the input then we actually prepare something which isn't quite circuit p it's actually the circuit P where the register of interest, so the, the, um, uh, the qubits which give you the distribution of interest are entangled with another register. And classically that's uh, the exact analog of the distribution of interest being uh, the marginal distribution of a, a bigger joint distribution. But I said that quantum Monte Carlo integration uh, completely naturally handles um, marginalization. And, and so that's actually sufficient. 
Um, and so this was, you know, it's, it's a fairly, it's, it's almost like a corollary of, of a result people use everywhere, really, that you can always build a reversible circuit of any function. But uh, I, I wanted to point that out. And actually, uh, I am fairly seriously investigating whether this kind of construction isn't just a sort of existence proof to show that we always can construct uh, the input circuit P, but whether in certain cases it will actually be a, a competitive way to prepare P, because in general, uh, there's no kind of agreed ways to actually do this. So I'm, you know, I'm quite excited about the potential for this. And the second result was noi a, a noise aware quantum amplitude estimation. And really, uh, this also uh, was something which bothered me, which is, you know, we, you, you know, I lecture at the uh, University of Cambridge, and I lecture based on the noise free model of quantum computing and it's all based on asymptotics about decision, um, you know, decision problems. And then at the end, we discuss the fact that there is the threshold theorem quantum error correction and, and in time we do have good, you know, good scientific reason to believe that we will have error correcting quantum computers. Um, but, but, you know, with my company hat on, then most of our attention is, is on near, you know, not necessarily kind of cutting corners and, and proposing something which will never work, but certainly we're, we're excited to think about things which are going to give us useful, you know, genuine and useful quantum advantage as soon as possible. And um, when we talk about something like uh, quantum phase estimation, free quantum amplitude estimation, as soon as those steps to actually, you know, you know, very impressive breakthroughs by a number of groups to actually remove the Fourier transform, the phase estimation step from quantum amplitude estimation. As soon as that happened, we started to think about this as a NISC application. Therefore, we're thinking about handling noise. Um, and actually, I was, again, quite encouraged because I've got quite a big background in classical data science, signal processing, information, things like that. Um, and even some wireless communications. And actually, uh, when we're talking about sampling and estimation, uh, we actually have the ability to handle some noise at the application level. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, and also because quantum amplitude estimation circuits are highly structured, you basically just got these, you know, now we've done away with the phase estimation. All we've got is basically these repeated uh, Grover iterates Q and then we measure a single qubit. And this kind of structure is the sort of thing which we can look to exploit when we're trying to understand what's going on in terms of the noise. So I was quite keen to see, you know, can we actually accept some noise? And, and the answer is we can. Um, and I'll say, yeah, I'll come on to say why. Uh, but just, I, I'm afraid I'm not going into enough detail for those of you who haven't um, really seen anything about amplitude estimation. Hopefully I'll, I'll give kind of a high level sketch of what's going on as well. Uh, but for those of you who have basically, what you do is you, you're given this circuit A, this is basically um, P followed by R. And what you want to do is, is estimate sine squared theta, and you don't need to worry too much about phi zero and phi one. What we're saying is just the amplitude of the final qubit. That's where the name amplitude estimation comes from. And so we, we can prepare this state with our A, which we're given as the input, that's P potentially constructed using kind of the reversible circuit and R, which through Fourier quantum Monte Carlo integration, we know need only be a bank of rotation gates. Um, and then from A, we can construct uh, this operator Q, which basically has two uses of A and a few other gates. And that does kind of successive rotations of two theta. Um, and so what basically I've shown in this, uh, this noise model uh, paper is that uh, noiselessly, if we just apply Q M times two, uh, to psi, then we just rotate by, you know, a zero just rotates by theta, and then every every instance of q just rotates by two theta. So we just get two m plus one theta uh, as the rotation angle. However, what I showed was uh, under fairly mild assumptions, uh, you get uh, an um, an additional rotation, a noise rotation that I call theta epsilon. And that's actually um, normally distributed with uh, mean and variance, each proportional to the circuit depth. Uh, and when I say fairly mild, um, these are these are the sort of assumptions that we make all the time in, in you know, they're an analog analogous to assumptions we make all the time in kind of classical wireless communications, things like this. Um, so, yeah, 
of course, uh, noise modeling is a notoriously difficult subject. So I wanted to do a few experiments. Uh, so I chose a particular, this is the circuit A. In fact, this isn't decomposed into a P and an R. This was just for kind of experimental purposes, the whole of A. And I designed it such that Psi is lined up pi on six away from zero, which means that on the first, the fourth, the seventh, the 10th um, iterations, then norm, you know, noiselessly, we would exactly align with the one axis, which would mean we'd get uh, uh, one, we'd measure one with certainty. And then with like the second, third, uh, fifth, sixth, et cetera, we're sort of pi on six away from the zero axis. So we'd measure zero with 75% uh, probability. So with this structure, we kind of can kind of see a little bit more visibly what's going on in terms of the noise. And what's going on? Well, if we look at these one, four, seven iterates, uh, then yeah, we recall noiselessly, we just be all the way along here. But of course we're getting noise, so we're kind of converging down towards the maximally mixed state. And actually this is pretty similar. In fact, in the papers actually kind of proven that it has pretty similar characteristics to depolarizing noise. And so we can see, you know, as we can see for these are uh, IBM, uh, I ran on Honeywell as well, but these are the five qubit IBM machines. However, what's interesting is that the noise model, the Gaussian noise model admits the fact that um, there might actually be a non-zero mean. And what I mean by this is uh, rather than just being a kind of a blurring around the, you know, the noiseless uh, state you've prepared, there's actually, each rotation is actually kind of offset by uh, a little bit, a constant little bit, plus the kind of the uh, zero mean noise. And so if we think about what happens to these second, third, fifth, sixth uh, Grover iterates, if we kind of have this positive offset, then this arrow will actually be slightly rotated further round, so it'll be pointing more in the zero direction. But the next one will also be rotated a bit further round, and will be pointed more in the one direction. And so we kind of what we expect is this kind of zigzagging effect, which is exactly what we see in reality. So the measured data in the in the black crosses lines up. If we just think about a depolarizing model, then we've still got basically the same shape. But if we use the Gaussian noise model, then we actually can map, match in general, very well match this zigzagging. So it does seem to be a very good experimental fit. And that was backed up. We did, I, you know, I've just shown you kind of a handful of results, but I did it for a number of different circuits on uh, various different uh, quantum hardware, including uh, ion traps and superconducting. And it, it was an excellent uh, a fit and better than the depolarizing noise across the board. And, Gaussian zero mean, I just forced there to be no bias. And in fact, as I mentioned, that's almost exactly identical to depolarizing. So the final thing I'm going to talk about is how we, you know, how we actually use this um, noise model. You know, it's, it's very nice to characterize things, but really what excited me was not just characterizing, but I believe we can use this to actually um, improve our quantum amplitude estimation in the presence of noise. So first of all, even though that this this um, zigzaggy pattern is is what really confirms this, uh, this this is actually really not good at all for doing amplitude estimation. This is an unobservable effect. You can't. There's no way you use an amplitude estimation to actually separate out this bias from the angle you're trying to estimate. So I I used Honeywell, which had basically no bias for all of the following. And so what we can use the noise. Uh, no, uh, noise model four is two things. First of all, um, if we talk about a deep circuit, then we are increasingly likely just to measure zeros, uh, sorry, zero and one each for 50% probability. Therefore, any, you know, being as we're just measuring, uh, you know, I should probably have said with all these kind of phase estimation free amplitude estimations, all we do at the end is measure the qubits whose amplitude we're interested in a number of times and then classically recombine um, recombine those uh, to give us kind of a, a, you know, using a Bayesian approach basically to give us our uh, estimate of the amplitude. Um, and so when we're talking about deep circuits, uh, then any discrepancy away from 50% zeros, 50% ones is kind of consequently more significant. And the noise model gives us an exact way to quantify how significant this is. And for those of you who kind of looked at classical signal processing, it's basically deconvolving out the noise. And we now actually do that in an exact quantified way. 
However, for deeper circuits, we're also, you know, we, we lose resolution by everything kind of squashing into, fifth, you know, to around 50% likelihood of zero, 50% likelihood of one. We lose information because of that noise. And what we can also do is use the noise model to tell us how, how much we need to ramp up our number of shots to get the same overall uh, confidence as if we would in the, uh, the noiseless case. And this is the rule that you have here. So N shot is the number of shots you do noiselessly and K sigma is from the noise model. So for, for M uses the Grover iterate Q, uh, you basically need four K sigma M plus one N shot. And this therefore, um, this tells you how to extend the range and how to allow for a little bit of noise. Because if we talk about, um, yeah, I'll, sorry, I think I will just pause a little bit and show some results and I'll talk about exactly what this is saying. So it's saying something very significant, but it's not saying we can just do things in the presence of any amount of noise, because we will eventually succumb to noise before we get quantum advantage if we try to, you know, I certainly don't want that to be the take home message. Uh, but yeah, first results, uh, and the results were very encouraging. So if we look at the blue, lines with the squares this is just if we if we just do it as if we're doing noiseless amplitude estimation so these are again root mean squared error plots uses of a so we're trying to converge down them we go the other way noiselessly um, and that's because we eventually just estimate 50 you know whatever angle corresponds to 50 percent uh zero is 50 percent ones if we just use the noise model to deconvolve out the noise well, we do a little bit better. This is the green with kind of these upward pointing triangles. Uh, these two are just two, two, two versions of the same thing, by the way, so I, sh I should say that. And they're quite jaggedy because I wasn't able to run too many shots in each run because I was running on Honeywell and, and we had a, a limited amount of time experimentally to do that. Um, so just deconvolving out the noise does us a certain amount of good, but really if we look at this black line with these side, sideward pointing triangles, this is using the noise model to its full extent in the noise aware, um, noise aware case. And we do continue to converge down for both, both rounds of uh, experiments. Uh, and the noiseless case we're not doing as well, which we wouldn't expect, um, but we are still converging down, which is what I wanted to show here. Uh, but that just lead me on to the implications um, because we've shown, you know, we have very much shown how to use the, the uh, characterizing noise such that it can be handled at application level. So what we're saying is we're, we're accepting the reality of noise, which I believe you have to do in this era. We, we have to bake into our handling of the data, the fact that it's noisy data. Um, but we, you know, data science is a huge thing, classical data science, and we, we do have the tools to, to do that. Um, but we do need caution um, because the, you know, we're talking about extending the range a little bit and, and for the sort of depths where we've only got mild noise, actually allowing for that noise. We're not talking about running arbitrarily deep circuits. That that would be, um, you, you know, we'd be we'd still be swallowed by noise, just like, you know, you can easily prove we are in any um, quantum application. That's why ultimately you always need error correction for decision problems. Um, and I do believe that we'd, we would need a bit of error correction for uh, quantum amplitude estimation for, for interesting problem sizes, the sort of problem sizes which exceed uh, what we can do classically and, and are of interest uh, to give us kind of a quantum advantage. That's assuming that quantum hardware sticks to roughly sticks to the kind of projections they've had. If there's some kind of incredible increase in fidelity, maybe we don't need any error correction. Um, but what I certainly hope is that we need less error correction. If you talk about the amount of error correction you'd need for a decision problem of the same size, which again is kind of conventionally how you'd think about error correction, I think because we're talking about estimation and, and sampling, we can get away with a lot less error correction. And that is uh, a really, uh, really high priority direction of research for my group and, and something I'm very excited about uh, with regards to trying to find uh, early quantum advantage in quantum amplitude estimation. Um, so yeah, that brings me on. I think I've, I've timed it pretty well. I'm certainly keen to hear any questions. Um, so, yeah, the talk was on quantum Monte Carlo integration, the full advantage of minimal circuit depth, one of three papers. Um, basically, Monte Carlo integration, how to do it with this, you know, with these minimally deep circuits. So just banks of rotation gates and the fact that we then have to decompose the function applied down into a Fourier series. Uh, but Monte Carlo integration basically requires as an input this circuit P. So I've um, shown how how we can always construct P out of kind of the classical sampling circuit. And 
Monte Carlo integration calls amplitude estimation as a subroutine, and I've, I've shown how we can do that in a noise-aware way. So even with the reality of noise in this gear, we can start to get a quantum advantage. Um, and yeah, I've also talked a little bit about some applications there. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for everyone to come, and I, I'd be delighted to take any questions in the last 10 minutes. Thank you, Stephen. This was uh, three seminars in one, I think, <laughs> if I counted it correctly. Uh, I, I don't see uh, yet uh, any uh, uh, questions in the chat, so maybe I'll start with a question. Uh, uh, so I'm coming from a finance uh, background. People in finance often care about the behavior of the function in the tails of the distribution. That's kind of a big deal, actually. Um, you sort of start out with this function that obviously lives on a discrete uh, set of uh, points, um, and then you sort of make this function periodic. Um, now, the, the tail issue is kind of uh, hidden in the way you define the range of that uh, density function. Uh, and so my question is, how does that really affect the, the the computational issues and also in particular how you make that function periodic what what's the impact of looking at the tail behavior and making that function sort of extend well, what you essentially do is you extend the range from what to, to a symmetric range i think uh, have you thought about this uh, which is actually this is i think an important issue for people in finance right yes yeah, so thank, thanks for the question i think that is um that is very pertinent. And then basically the way I answer this is uh, appealing to the idea that you have to do this classically anyway. Um, so just to, just to clarify, P is what prepares your um, distribution. So this, you know, that's a PDF and that's something which is classically or quantumly already something which you've truncated and you've basically- Yeah, made. sure. Um, and, Classically, you kind of because because you know the number of bits you take is um, only the logarithm of the precision. You kind of just take as read that that is um, you know you can always like err on the side of caution. You're not going to extend um, your kind of your need computation particularly um, prohibitively. And we you know we have to be a little bit more careful when we talk about uh, NIST gear quantum computations for obviously resource constrained, but essentially we appeal to the same idea, which is uh, you still basically do exactly what you do classically. Um, and so you know your tails of your distribution. If if you need to extend to a certain point and you need a certain resolution classically, then the default is we're going to do exactly the same thing quantumly. Uh, now the function applied is. Um, when we talk about the function applied, this could be just, you know, this is, uh, if we just talk about the expectation, then the function applied is just f of x equals x. And so what we need to do there is make sure that the function, you know, uh, as long as we make sure we do really do extend um, such that the function applied really does cover the entire support, uh, then, then we're, we're sort of home and dry uh, because we are, you know, this uh, identity, here is exact. Um, so, you know, by doing the periodic, uh, by kind of swapping in the periodic version, we're not, we're not, um, yeah, we're not cutting any corners at all. If you were to try to uh, squeeze this somehow and not quite extend all the way to the edge of the support, then potentially would kind of got non, you know, if we, again, if we're just computing the mean, you would get kind of some non-linearities in the tails and Again, that's something you may be prepared to do to get kind of marginal gains if you really don't care about the tails. But as a default, we say you do care about the tails. The reason you've extended the periodic, the probability density function out as far as you had is because that's the region you care about, and therefore you don't want to cut any corners in the function applied. Um, and it would actually only be a relatively marginal gain to kind of try to cut corners here anyway. So, um, so yeah, in principle, we will always just assume that the function applied does extend exactly to the, you know, to whatever you've decided the appropriate truncation is when you're actually preparing the state. And that would be the same as what you do classically. So in principle, um, yeah, you, you get the same precision, you'd get the same quantity, you just get there quadratically faster, even with NISC, NISC quantum 
Monte Carlo integration. Um, I have a since we don't have uh, much from the audience, uh, unfortunately, uh, your uh, kind of inversion argument going you, in classically, you can always go from a uniform distribution to pretty much any uh, distribution via, via deterministic map. Uh, that kind of does, does exclude distributions that have flat regions uh, because that makes it non-invertible. And, and uh, you don't, we don't care about this. I mean, the sense that there are quite a few applications where that might be the, the, the case. And in fact, I think the case which you showed where you had zero probability over an entire range, uh, and then you had a pileup in both tails is kind of a case that I think you cannot really think about a deterministic map in a trivial way. Is it, am I, am I, do you, am I right on this? Uh, so that's, I think that if I just go, oh, I didn't put the- Yeah, that's that picture in there. Uh, yeah, we missed it somewhere, right? Yes. Yeah, I, there we go. So, I mean, it's by far, um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to appeal to is the idea that, that you can do anything which you would do on a quantum computer. You could ultimately, you know, I, I've got a project on this at the moment, which is trying to actually look at, you know, if, if you're sampling from any distribution on a classical com computer, trying to actually walk down the kind of the comp compiler tree and look at exactly what's going on there and mm -hmm. basically turn that into a series of logic gates. Uh, now, if that does itself have some approximation in it, then that approximation would be inherited into the, into the quantum state preparation. Yeah. But what we're saying is whatever kind of compromised approximations you've deemed acceptable classically, you just inherit those quantum. You don't introduce additional, um, additional uh, uh, kind of compromises just by virtue of the fact you're doing it to quantum, which is what I wanted to show. But you do raise an interesting point, which is there, there are kind of more kind of natively quantum ways to prepare states, which in many cases may be better than doing the kind of the key marginal construction. Yeah. Um, so this, this may well be an advantage. And, and um, I'm also, you know, another active area of research is to do with, um, you know, if we're talking about sampling kind of Monte Carlo, uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, so, you know, it's well known that some quantum walks mix faster than mm -hmm. classical walks. And so if, if you're kind of sampling, you know, your quantum classical sampling circuit could itself just be some Markov chain Monte Carlo method. And that may be something where we can actually mix faster quantumly by kind of looking at the quantum, the quantum walk. And that would again be a kind of complementary uh, gain on top of what I presented today. So that's, yeah, it's very much kind of a starting point to make sure we don't do worse than classically in the state preparation. but. I think, yeah, I think it's probably been a fairly major direction of research, mainly in kind of the QGAN community to try to kind of prepare very low depth circuits for state, you know, to prepare the states which encode these probabilities. There, there is another thought here, which, um, uh, I, I mean, we're live being recorded and we're talking about research ideas, but that's fine. Uh, uh, I mean, this picture uh, uh, kind of suggests that uh, something is, uh, I think, very powerful for quantum computing would be to look at mixture distributions, uh, which is very, which are relatively easy to uh, to construct on a quantum machine uh, as, as a way to approximate quite a lot of distributions. Uh, because in statistics, we know that there's a whole way of a very general theory on, on constructing uh, 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 distributions through mixtures. Uh, and, and you basically actually have a mixture distribution here, in, in, essentially. So uh, I, I think that might be an interesting path to go um, uh, down as well. Uh, we have a question from, uh, anyway, this was just a, a thought. <laughs> but, yeah. well, we, uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, let me read it. Will a similar method be followed for portfolio optimization prepare state, apply circuit R, encode uh, the function uh, QAE, uh, the follow-up question is: uh, There an estimate of resource requirement? What is the reduction percentage? Yeah, I think you can read the question as well. So maybe um, if you go to the chat, but uh, might, yeah, I can try because there, there's it's multiple questions. Okay, let me just. So, 
or I can read it again and you can go step by step. In the chat, so, you might be appearing on my shared screen, but um, yeah, I, I, so first of all, yes, it's the same process. Um, and in, in general, when we talk about portfolio optimization, what's interesting there is, well, not what's only interesting, but one of the things which might be interesting is, is a correlation. So the, the assets, um, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, that's again, why I talk about uh, why we'd use Monte Carlo. Um, so yeah, it would be the same process. And uh, sorry, interrupt. And, and you do cover multivariate distributions, yeah. which is kind of the real the real kicker here. Yeah. Um, the resource estimate. Uh, I don't uh, because I because I kind of took this directly from the the um, you know I did my resource estimates on the back of that uh, very interesting paper by Goldman and IBM. Except right. I, I think that I think the kind of the the kind of current wisdom is that 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 the uh, derivative pricing will be the first application and the portfolio optimization the second. Uh, it's uh, it's interesting because when we talk about derivative pricing, we're basically talking about doing something really quickly, whereas when we're talking about portfolio optimization or, or certain risk uh, calculations, we're talking about doing something which might, there might not be a real premium on speed, but it might be hard to do in any sort of reasonable time classically. And therefore we're talking about a much bigger problem size, which probably needs to come later um it's something i'm interested in doing is trying to understand the resource requirements of that as well but not something i have done uh, yet uh, in terms of the quantum monte carlo i mean broadly speaking these the saving uh would be similar uh, in terms of what the quantum monte carlo integration saves you uh, it would be in the same ballpark because it's you know still a circuit p and a circuit r where the circuit r is replaced by um a bank of rotations so it'd still be in the same ballpark perhaps perhaps slightly more at the lower end, I guess, would be, you know, to be conservative, I, I would say it might be kind of at the lower end of that, but it would still be in the sort of 30, 90% uh, region just by using very quantum Monte Carlo integration would be my best, uh, my best uh, statement I could make on that at present. Thank you. Uh, I agree with you on the option pricing versus uh, portfolio optimization. I mean, and this is what I think is interesting about your paper is that uh, the, the, I mean, obviously everybody has first looked at Black Scholes, which which you can solve analytically, but then the, the the real kicker for quantum computing is going to be to look at functions of payoff functions that are much more complex for which we don't have closed form solutions, and this is where your uh, uh, approach is really interesting, I think, in terms of dealing with the general functions and and sort of having a minimal depth. Uh, a circuit that's uh, kind of ways of getting to the quadratic uh, speed up. So that, I think that's absolutely right. For I think the first application is going to be option pricing before we get <laughs> to the, I think, more demanding actually portfolio applications. Um, I don't see, we're kind of running out of time actually. Uh, this was a delight to have you. Um, and uh, this is also great work being done at uh, Cambridge Quantum. It's, it's really, really a pleasure to have you. Uh, I'd like to finish, first of all, by thanking you uh, and to announce, uh, since you mentioned um, a few times IBM <laughs> and uh, Goldman, uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Nick Stamatopoulos, who is one of the authors, actually, of the paper that Stephen referred to uh, a few times. Uh, that will be on November 18th. Um, Nick has not announced yet what paper he's going to present. He has a surprise for us. Uh, stay tuned and please visit uh, the website. We will make uh, soon uh, uh, all the details available. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. This was an absolutely delight. Uh, thank you, Stephen, again. Um, and uh, see you next time. Take care, everybody.